KNON 89.3 FM in Dallas and Fort Worth, the voice of the people. Business owners, tell KNON's listeners about your business. You can put your business or event on KNON. KNON currently has space available to run announcements for you. Tell KNON's listeners about your goods, services, nightclub, concert, or event. Help keep the voice of the people on the air while putting your information on the air. KNON's been named the number one radio station in Dallas by both the Dallas Observer and D Magazine. Put your business with Dallas's number one station. Call now for more information at 214-828-9500, extension 227 or extension 233. For more information, go to KNON.org and click on the Run Spots on KNON page. It's a great way for your business to support community radio while letting more people know about you. This is William, your videographer for the KNON talk shows. You can watch Get Off My Lawn by going to the KNON.org website. Click on Schedules and choose Get Off My Lawn's page. Scroll to the bottom and choose your favorite show to watch. This show will be ready for viewing by Tuesday lunchtime. Have a great day. What a game. What a game. Jim Shoots with Get Off My Lawn on... Uh, Pledge Drive Day, and uh, uh, the, the lead-in to the show was uh, all about how you could watch me uh, on the, you could see the video on the webpage and listen to the show. Uh, maybe not. I can, I, can, uh, I can go away in the snap of a finger here <laughs> without your support. Uh, Can O.N.'s not going to go away in the snap of a finger. I'll go away a lot faster than Can O.N. will, but... Uh, Canowin needs your support. This is community radio. It's supported by you. That's why you don't hear any commercials. Uh, everybody, all the DJs uh, and, the, and the talkers like me here are unpaid volunteers. Uh, this is a community effort, and it brings you a window on uh, the news, what's going on that you're not going to get from establishment media. Uh, it also brings you music that you're not going to hear on establishment media. Uh, that's because DJs here can play the music they want to. It's not all uh, uh, sort of fixed and wired up the way it is in commercial radio. That's why that's why KNON is different, and uh, it depends absolutely on on your support. Uh, call me up at nine seven two six four seven one eight nine three. Nine seven two six four seven one eight nine three. Please call w with a pledge, and uh, we'll talk more about uh, how how, you, how to do that and and what you can get in re return for the pledge. The station, you know, shows its gratitude by sending you. A, there's a long list of cool stuff here that you get. You don't just send the money off into the ozone and that's it. You you get a thank you from KNON. And, uh, and a gift along with it. But you also keep Kano in here and kicking. And, uh, and it, it, it is really up to you. Uh, s some of the huge corporate sponsorships that go to uh, uh, public radio, that's different. That's, you know, other, that's another radio station. And they get a lot of corporate sponsorship I'm very, because, you know, I suffer, I have a disability. I suffer from uh, bad personality syndrome, BPS. And uh, because of my syndrome, uh, I, uh, I have a jaundiced view of that other public radio station. I refer to them very unfairly. I'm ashamed of myself for this, but I refer to them as Radio Free Park Cities. Uh, they have a very predictable and an establishment view, sometimes even more than commercial radio. And that's the difference here with KNON. KNON's out from under that thumb. It's not under the thumb the way most other local media is. And that's because of donations from you, entirely because of that. If the donations ain't there, we're not here. So it's 972-647-1893. Please, uh, Reach down in that, that pocket or purse and, and find a way to help us. 
972 I have something I wanted to, to uh, talk to you today. It's this lifelong mystery that I've uh, dealt with. It has to do with Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, you know who she is. She's the African-American woman who uh, uh, supposedly, according to history, according to legend, sort of kicked off uh, uh, the desegregation movement. December 1, 1955, uh, she was riding on a segregated bus in the South, and uh, the story was that this uh, the driver told her to get out of her seat so this white man could sit down. And uh, according to legend, she was this humble, quiet lady just sitting there staring at her feet. And uh, humble, dignified, soft-spoken, not angry, never raised her voice. That's all part of the Rosa Parks legend. And uh, she was told to get out of her seat, and uh, her feet hurt. Her feet were tired. She just couldn't do it. And so she didn't get out of her seat, and stuff happened after that. And so the whole, uh, it's kind of like the civil rights movement was kicked off by this one little modest, humble moment of rebellion by this, uh, African American lady on a on a bus. My, I've always had some problems with that story. In the seventies, uh, I, I was a reporter in Detroit, and Rosa Parks was living in Detroit. She was an older lady by then, and I had a friend, a fellow reporter named Susan Watson who was supposed to have a relationship with Rosa Parks. The paper we worked for had this idea that Susan knew Rosa Parks. And so every few years we'd get a new editor from somewhere. And the editor would say, hey, doesn't that Rosa Parks live here? And uh, so on the anniversary of, of the Rosa Parks bus incident, the, whoever the new editor was would say, hey, I hear, go over to Susan Watson and say, Susan, I, I understand you know Rosa Parks. Why don't we do a story about what she's up to? And uh, in the culture of newspapers, when, when you have a connection like that and the editor wants you to do a story, you say yes. Oh, yeah, I got Rosa Parks in my pocket. I'll go do the R Rosa Parks story. So the editor would walk off and Susan would let out this huge sigh like she'd just been hit in the head with a baseball bat. And she'd trundle off to go talk to Rosa Parks again. And then she'd come back to the paper, and she sat right across from me, which is why I knew all this. And she would talk to herself and say, that lady is so mean. I hate going out there. Oh, I, 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 I wish I could never have to talk to Rosa Parks again for the rest of my life. <laughs> and I talked to Susan about it, and... And part of it, in, in uh, Susan was fairer than that about it, and she said in Rosa Parks' defense, Rosa Parks was just sick of doing this same story year after year. So Susan shows up at her door, and Rosa Parks would say, not you again. We did this three years ago. I have nothing new to say. And then Susan would have to wheedle and plead and say, please let me do my story. And finally, Rosa Parks would give in and give her some kind of interview. But I said to Susan, I... Th I thought my image of Rosa Parks was this sweet little old lady who just that one day on the bus, she just ran out of patience. And Susan gave me this cold stare and she stuck her finger in my face. She used a word that I can't repeat on the air uh, for things that are not true. The, the initials for the word are B-S. And she said, whoever said that lady was a sweet lady? was handing out a line of total BS. And so that story always stuck in my head. Um, there's another thing I want to get to that has to do with Dallas and buses and research that I did back in the 70s, which led me to this, for me, amazing discovery, because I never got it in school, which was that Dallas was having many riots over bus segregation in the 1940s 15 years before Rosa Parks and Dallas I was the, the story about Dallas was oh there was never any trouble here yeah people people just lived with the system with segregation and I'll, I'll tell you about in a minute how I, I, I came to this discovery that I don't know about them living with the system but I found evidence of 
riots, people pouring off the buses, black people pouring off segregated buses in the 40s, all kinds of squad cars and cops and people rocking the bus and threatening to set it on fire. I'm not laughing because I think that's funny. It's just so ironic because it's so much at odds. And also, it was the second piece of my little Rosa Parks puzzle that I didn't get. I thought, according to the history books that I got in high school and in college, everybody kind of accepted it until Rosa Parks didn't. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. I want to go back to our, our pledge drive. You know, I told you that if you called us up at 972-647-1893 and gave us some help, some money, that's what, what we need to keep this place afloat, that the station is truly appreciates that help and, and shows its appreciation by sending you something back. Uh, there's a list of stuff, and, and, and we can talk to you about it more if, in detail if you call, but... You know, for a $50 pledge, uh, they'll send you uh, Mardi Gras T-shirts, yellow and gold, or purple, uh, with the, you know, can uh, logo on it. Mardi Gras beads, which is more than just the little beads. It's, it's a 30-inch uh, string of beads with a 3.5-inch uh, medallion that has the can and logo on it. They'll send you Mardi Gras uh, shot glasses, which is pretty cool. Uh, with the Cano and logo. There are a bunch of things like that. There's also a, a, another aspect of the pledge drive that I, I wanted to make sure you, you were aware of. If you're a working person and you work for a company, you can double your pledge drive. A lot of these companies uh, will match a gift like this. They have a program. They got a budget for it. The money's sitting there. And so you call us up and give us a hundred bucks. And by the way, you can you can stage that out. We'll talk about that later too. You can you can give it in payments. You can even have a uh, electronic <coughs> excuse me funds transfer uh, direct from your bank. You can do all that. But but let's say that you somehow found it in your heart uh, to give us a hundred bucks, uh, which, which would be a big help. You can turn that hundred into two hundred. You have if you go to your HR department and say, "Oh, yeah, it's not a big deal." You say, "Look, do you guys do we have a matching gift program here?" A lot of companies are going to say yes, and then you say, "Okay, here, here's my paperwork. I gave a hundred bucks to uh, KNON, and they'll say, "Okay, we'll send them another hundred. So all of a sudden, your hundred becomes two hundred, your fifty becomes a hundred. Uh, your $10,000 gift becomes $20,000. Wouldn't that be sweet? Uh, but but it's, it's an important... You, you don't want to miss that bet if you work somewhere and it's a possibility. It's 972-647-1893. 972-647-1893. We're talking about uh, raising money to keep, uh, keep us on the air. And we're talking about uh, Rosa Parks. Um, let me see how much time I got left. And uh, oh, I got some time. So I was talking about, about uh, Dallas and bus segregation back in the day. And uh, the story about Dallas in particular is always that, oh, there was never any trouble here. So I was doing this research back in the 80s for a book I was working on. And I, it, it involved reading the old newspapers on microfilm at the library, the Morning News and the Dallas Times-Herald and the African-American newspapers. And I came across this weird thing one day in the Morning News. Uh, the Morning News was always the more conservative paper, and, and the Herald was the more liberal paper, so-called, for the time. So the thing in the Morning News was this little story, I can almost quote it, uh, there was not an incident last night at 8 p.m. at uh, Bonnie View and Ledbetter, uh, contrary to erroneous reports. Uh, just a few lines. Uh, uh, no disturbance took place uh, on the city bus, the Dallas Transit System bus. And I thought, that's weird. I have a story saying something didn't happen. 
So I, I, I quick jumped to the Times Herald for the same day. And it said, reports of an incident at Bonnie View and Ledbetter last night were highly erroneous. Uh, more than 100 people did not pile off a city bus and rock the bus, threatening to set it on fire. Um, far fewer than the reported 60 patrol cars showed up. Uh, blah, blah, blah. All this detail. <laughs> and so then you go, sometimes I was able to go, because I found a bunch of incidents like this. And sometimes I was able to go to the black newspapers, which would have a little more detail. And so the, the picture that emerges is something happened at Bonnie View and Ledbetter on that night. And that led me to, to look more closely at bus segregation. How did, how did bus segregation work? The story I had gotten in the history books was always pretty simple, that there was a black part of the bus and a white part of the bus. That's not, that's not how it worked, and, and it's significant to know how it really worked. How, how am I doing? I, okay. Uh, on a Dallas bus, there were 12 ceramic signs, 12 of them, that could be hung at different parts of the bus. And they said colored or white. And it was up to the bus driver to move the signs around. So if you had uh, 30 uh, uh, black riders and 10 white riders, you'd adjust the signs so that there were more black seats. The black section, which was toward the back of the bus, would be bigger, and the white section smaller. And the bus driver was supposed to be watching this uh, so he could keep it right so, you know, it, everybody could sit down. But the bus drivers, for whatever reason, wouldn't watch it and wouldn't move the signs necessarily. So you'd have like five white people on the bus and, and you'd have 20 seats in the white section. So 15 of them would be empty. You'd have way, way more black people on the bus if it was headed at the end of the day from North Dallas to Southern Dallas. But, but the bus driver would leave too few seats in the black section. So you got black people standing up because they don't have enough seats. And then you have all these empty seats in the white section. And the, th the thing that emerges from these newspaper stories is that nobody stayed quiet about it. The black people would shout to the bus driver, hey, you, you need to move the sign. I'll come back to this story uh, after this break. Jim shoots with uh, Get Off My Lawn. Community Radio provides the kind of programming you won't find anywhere else on the dial. Nowhere else can you find such a variety of formats and personalities in North Texas as on KNON. But this is only possible through the support of our listeners. KNON depends on listener support to stay on the air. Now is the time for you to help keep this show on the air. This pledge drive will continue until the station reaches its goal. If you're waiting out the pledge drive, you might be waiting out the existence of this show on KNON too. So don't wait for someone else to do it. Without the support of people like you, there wouldn't be any community radio on the air in North Texas. So take a few minutes and make a pledge. 972-647-1893. 972-647-1893 to keep your favorite programs on KNON. This is William, your videograph for the KNON Saturday Talk Shows. You can watch church information and form by going to the knon.org website. Click on Schedule to the left side of your screen and choose Church Information and Form page. Scroll to the bottom of the page and choose your favorite show to watch or download. This show will be ready for viewing by Tuesday lunchtime. Have a great day. Get off my lawn. Jim Shoots with uh, back with Get Off My Lawn. We've been talking about Rosa Parks. Uh, the hundredth anniversary of her birth is coming up. She died in 2005. She's the lady who uh, wouldn't give up her seat on the bus and and spurred uh, uh, the spurred uh, a great uh, reaction that that 
became what we think of as the civil rights movement. But I've been talking about the kind of the difference between the Rosa Parks legend and uh, these little windows that I had into the reality of Rosa Parks. She seemed like a lot, from people I knew who knew her, she seemed like a lot uh, pricklier, edgier, tougher person, not the little sweet old lady sitting on the bus that the history books project. And then I, I said before the break that I also came across this evidence uh, in doing research on the, on the history of Dallas that far from being the first person to do this, here in Dallas, where everybody always tells you that the lid was on, every, there was never any trouble here, there were many riots, many riots over bus segregation back in the 40s. 15 years before Rosa Parks. And I was explaining before the break how the bus segregation worked. There were these signs on the buses, and they're supposed to, the bus driver is supposed to move them up and down to adjust the size of the black seats and the white seats. And they didn't always do it. For whatever reason, they were busy, or they didn't feel like it, or they were mean, and they wanted to make the black people stand up, whatever. They didn't always do it. And so this... this uh, the black people would tell the bus driver, move the sign. And the bus driver would sometimes refuse. The other piece of the puzzle here that emerged when I read these stories that I thought was really interesting was the black passengers would wait until that bus, bus was in the black part of town so that that bus driver knew if something happened he wasn't, he wasn't going to get much help from the people around him. He was in black Dallas now. And then they would insist, move that sign. And some of the <coughs> bus drivers were hard-headed and wouldn't do it and wouldn't move the sign. And then there would be this violent reaction. I don't know what happened because it's so covered up in the reporting and the history of the time, but whatever happened involved up to 50 patrol cars <laughs> for one incident. That's back when Dallas was a way smaller place. It's, it, you know, we'd, we'd think of it as uh, smaller than Tyler is now. 50 patrol cars had to be the whole police force uh, getting people out of bed. Uh, so these were big deals. And they, it meant that nobody ever, ever accepted bus segregation. Now, the, the other piece of the puzzle uh, that came clear for me about Rosa Parks came when I finally read um, Taylor Branch's wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning book published, man I'm thinking that it was late 90's uh, it's called Parting the Waters and it's a, it's a top to bottom scholarly uh, reportage of the whole civil rights movement and and in particular he deals with the Rosa Parks thing and he explains how how the Rosa Parks <coughs> incident on the bus happened there was nothing spontaneous about it it was entirely planned and strategic and she was chosen for the part and I'll come back to that in a second this is this is a pledge drive here at KNON uh, we, we sincerely need your help to keep the station on the on the air, uh, this is, is true people's radio. And the benefit of all of that is, is I mean, the stuff, it, it changes what you hear when you listen to the radio station. You don't hear commercials. Um, the content is different. You get a different content here than you're going to get from commercial radio or, or uh, traditional public radio. Uh, because we don't have, we're not under that thumb that controls traditional media. Uh, we're under your thumb. It's all your thumb, and it's your thumb thumbing out some greenbacks for us, uh, and we need that help. That's the magic that keeps it going. We're at 972-647-1893. 972-647-1893. Uh, I always hear myself and other other DJs and talkers here talking about the cheap gifts you can give the little gifts it's interesting to know that that you could there are some big gifts you can give that have a, a lot of punch for you personally for example let's say 
you got some extra money in your pocket. You just had a windfall, and something moves your heart to call us up and give us a $500 pledge. Now, that's very significant to, for keeping the station on the air. Uh, what do you get for that? Well, what you get is a pretty cool return. Uh, you get a pair of tickets for every Canoen benefit for the year. So what is that? That's 40 to 50 shows a year. Uh, th these, are, these are great. It's called an elite music sponsor package. And, and the shows are live music at the Sons of Herman Hall, Poor David's, uh, Thanksgiving Breakfast in the Canoen Live Music Room, the Red Elvises, the Crawfish Boils, Barbecue and Blues Parties, uh, the annual Canoen Blues Fest, uh, the Tejano Benefits, uh, Rosie Ledette, um, the Mardi Gras Gumbo Party, on and on. And so it's like an entire social life <laughs> that, uh, man, I don't know. I'm looking at this and thinking, what would I do with a social life? That would change me forever. Uh, I should have, I wish somebody had told me about this when I was a little younger. You know, the things might have gone differently if I'd had a social life. Uh, but, but, but that's an example of uh, some, something. If you're generous with Canoen, Canoen's generous with you, and, and you're making a huge difference in the, in the community uh, by keeping Canoen on the air, uh, that's just an example. You don't have to give 500 bucks. You can. Uh, but uh, you can give a more, a more modest gift and uh, call us up and we can explain the painless ways that you can do it. 972-647-1893. <clears throat> We've been talking about Rosa Parks and uh, the, the bus desegregation and uh, some of my personal experiences with the Rosa Parks story. And I was explaining how uh, Taylor Branch in his book Parting the Waters explained how Rosa Parks really, how that all really happened. Rosa Parks worked for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And <clears throat> she was, uh, she's sometimes described as a secretary there that doesn't quite get it. She was an activist. She was a trained activist. She chose to work there. She was part of the deal, part of the staff. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference decided that they were going to have an incident around the bus around bus desegregation, and they timed it, and and they planned it, and they made sure that when it started, uh, there would be reporters on the bus to see it. In fact, they chose another woman who was going to be the woman to refuse to give her seat up, but they vetted her first. And this is an example of how strategic this SCLC was and how smart they were. And they knew that the media would start looking into the background of whoever was this woman chosen for this role to refuse to give up her seat. The first woman they chose had had a child out of wedlock, as it was described back then. <clears throat> she had a baby and she wasn't married. Uh, now, I, I'm not sure that would be a big sticking point for anybody, but this was the, the 50s, and it would have been a big deal. That she would have been portrayed as immoral and so on. So they passed on her, and they chose Rosa Parks instead because she had a spotless past. So this thing was scripted, and the reporters were told when it was going to happen, and Rosa Parks knew what she was going to do. She was going to refuse to give up her seat. It's very unlike the story that's told in the history books of this quiet, modest little lady who just her feet hurt and so on. Now, all the, I'm talking about this because there's a review in the New York Times this morning of a new Rosa Parks uh, book. It's called The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks uh, by Jean Theo Harris, a Brooklyn College professor. And it tells who Rosa Parks really was. Uh, quite unlike the mythological story that I, I, last time I checked, kids in high school were still being given this story of Rosa Parks, the little quiet lady, <laughs> staring at her feet. Uh, that's, that's not who she was. Uh, she was always an angry, rebellious person who 
hated segregation, and I'm sorry to say, uh, for folks who look like me, hated white people. Yeah, right. Uh, here's a quote uh, from, from this new book. Quote, how I hated all white people, especially him. She, well, she's talking about a guy, uh, an employer who tried to rape her. So that makes it a little more understandable. Later, as a participant in the civil rights movement, she took part in training sessions with white people, and she decided, okay, something can be worked out between us and white people. It wasn't exactly what we think of as integration today. It was a more separatist view, but she decided there were some white people she could live with. Her, her grandfather was a follower of Marcus Garvey, who was a black separatist. And he was a guy who used to sit on his porch, according to this, this uh, book review by Charles M. Blow in the Parks today. Parks' grandfather used to sit on his porch with a rifle, hoping that the Klan would show up so he could shoot somebody. And Rosa Parks, as a little girl, used to sit with him. Because as she says in the book, quote, I wanted to see him kill a Ku Kluxer. So, so this is not a little quiet lady, ever. When she, uh, uh, when she was a little kid, according to the book, a young white man taunted her. I don't know what the taunt was, but she threatened to kill him with a brick. Her grandmother took her aside, told her that she was too high strung, and that she was going to get lynched before the age of 20. Rosa responded, quote, I would be lynched rather than be run over by them. But what her grandmother didn't tell her, and her parents didn't tell her, was to be sweet and humble. They told her to keep her anger under control, but to keep her anger. They didn't tell her she was wrong to be angry. They just said, be cool. Watch what you do. Don't give them a chance to lynch you. But don't give up your anger. So this Rosa Parks that emerges from this, this uh, new book is way, is not like the legend of Rosa Parks, but it is like the lady who lived in Detroit when I was there. Uh, my friend Susan Watson always had to, to go out and... and uh, interview and Susan would come back and say she is so mean <laughs> and she did have a mean streak uh, she married Raymond Parks who was a civil rights activist who carried a gun and that impressed her because she said quote he refused to be intimidated by white people so here's the real Rosa Parks emerging tough uh, smart very angry angry at white people, and very determined to do something about it. And here's the real Rosa Parks incident on the bus, not spontaneous, planned, choreographed, scripted for the media. So you have this question, or I have this question, okay, how come it was told the other way? Because it was, look, it was the, the, the Rosa Parks legend is there because that's how it was told by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The white, i got to say one thing for white folks here. We didn't make that story up. That came from the African-American leadership of the Civil Rights Movement. And, and uh, we can talk about why that would be, why it would be told that way, and why it's taken all these years to peel the onion and get back to the real Rosa Parks story. Uh, Call me up if you have uh, not thoughts of this. Uh, uh, in the last uh, section of the show, I want to get to something that came up in a, in a Dallas City Council retreat, of all things, last week about some of this history and the story that, that black ministers in Dallas <coughs> were hostile to integration and hostile to Martin Luther King Sr. There's another, in this council retreat, Believe it or not, this came up. And the Reverend Zan Holmes, who's the emeritus pastor of St. Luke Community Methodist, gave a little window on the truth there, which is like this Rosa Parks story. It's the, the truth is quite different from the legend, nationally and locally. Uh, call us up, too, if you can 
if you can spare a few bucks this morning, 972-647-1893. This is our pledge drive, and and uh, it's so important uh, that we get your help. Now, I'm a little bit selfish about this because uh, uh, I always talk about how KNON needs the money to stay on the air. I need you to call up and, and, and uh, keep me on the air because... There's a point at which if I'm the one guy out of everybody who doesn't raise any money, uh, they're going to say, shoots, sorry, uh, you got to go. We got to get somebody on here who can help us uh, get some support a little bit better. So call, call us up at, at uh, 972-647-1893. We got Clint Ashley sitting here ready to take your call and uh, take your pledge, 972 972- Six four seven one eight nine three. It's Jim Shoots <coughs> coughing into the microphone and uh, uh, bringing you get off my lawn. We've been talking about Rosa Parks and some of the the way the legend of of the civil rights movement is told and how how far it is from what really happened. And 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 in the last section of the show, I want to get to why that might have been. Uh, Bottom line, I don't know, but I have I have a two-bit theory, and I'd be I'd be interested in hearing what what you think about it as as well. Nine seven two six four seven one eight nine three. Um, the point being that this story is was told at the time as uh, the Rosa Parks story was this sort of quiet, humble, uh, staring at her feet uh, lady, soft-spoken. A uh, sweet little old lady, just tired, just tired, and her feet were hurting, and she didn't want to get up. Uh, there's this new book, and there's a review of it in the New York Times today, uh, about the real Rosa Parks story. One of the quotes in it was, I didn't tell anyone my feet were hurting. It was just popular, I suppose, because they wanted to give some excuse, other than the fact that I didn't want to be pushed around. Now that, that sounds like the real Rosa Parks that I knew of from back when I was in Detroit and she was living in Detroit and I knew people who knew her. That sounds like the Rosa Parks I knew of, not the Rosa Parks that high school kids are taught, and I'm afraid college kids are still taught, who's the quiet little old lady <clears throat> who just, uh, you know, couldn't get up because her feet were hurting her. That's not what happened. And that's not who Rosa Parks was. And so when we come back uh, for the last part of the show, uh, we want to talk about why the story would have been told that way. Because it wasn't told that way by white people. White people believed it, and it's kind of what they maybe wanted to hear, but it was the leadership of the Civil Rights Movement, African-American leadership, that created this Rosa Parks legend. Uh, 972-647-1893. Call us with a pledge, and we'll be back after this break. Jim Hightower has moved to be a part of KNON's Speak Up Saturday. Jim Hightower's segments can now be heard at the start of each of KNON's great talk programming starting at 7 a.m. with Reverend Marion Barnett's show, Church Information and Open Forum, with the news and talk of South Dallas. Then at 9, the CWA presents Workers Beat with the news and talk of the unions hosted by Gene Lance and Bonnie Mathias. At 10, the Dallas Observer presents Get Off My Lawn with Jim Shoots, bringing you the other side of Dallas news. Finishing up Speak Up Saturdays at 11 is Lambda Weekly with the news and talk of the LGBTQ community, hosted by David Taffet, Patty Fink, and Laurent Landis. Now starting at each of these shows is Jim Hightower's insightful segment at 7. 8, 9, 10, and 11 a.m. each and every Saturday morning right here on The Voice of the People, KNON 89.3 FM. KNON depends on listener support to stay on the air, and now is the time for you to help keep this show on the air. If you like what you're hearing and want to show your appreciation for great community radio, pick up the phone and call to make a pledge. Call 972-647-1893 or go online to KNON.org. Don't wait for someone else to do it. Without the support of our listeners, there won't be any community radio on the air in North Texas. 
So take a few minutes to make a pledge. Call 972-647-1893 or go online to KNON.org. Get off my lawn. Hey, babes. <laughs> I'll take one now. Jim Shoots back with uh, Get Off My Lawn Pledge Drive at KNON uh, 972 647 972 There are ways that you can you can uh, give us some money that are you know, I don't know if they're painless but they're less painful maybe and one of them is a, is a check off where uh, you can arrange to just have a, a monthly payment uh, transferred directly uh, from your bank to, to Cano N's bank and it, it makes it a little easier to remember and uh, makes it uh, maybe a little less painful. Uh, it costs 4200 bucks a month for this station just to lease its radio tower. The station has to pay. You know, I'm, I'm telling you this because uh, we talk about how all the DJs are volunteers and the talkers like me, but but there's stuff that just has to be paid for. In fact, there's $43,000 worth of stuff every month that has to be paid for to keep this place up and running. Two thousand, Over $2,000 just in office rent. 1600 bucks a month in electricity. How would you like to have a $1,600 uh, electric bill? $1,000 for engineering services? I can go on down the list. I'm just telling you, it's not cheap to keep a radio station on the air. And that's, that's why uh, any bit of help that you can give is so appreciated and so important. It's the only money we get. So, 972-647-1893. If you can possibly do a dig deep, call us up and, and give us a hand. Uh, we're, we're talking about uh, Rosa Parks and desegregation and, and how it all happened. Uh, and, and the occasion for talking about this is... Uh, uh, column that's kind of a book review in the New York Times this morning on the op-ed page by Charles M. Blow, a new book on Rosa Parks. And I've been talking about the incredible difference between the Rosa Parks legend and the reality. And the reality was that she was way tougher and edgier, meaner, meaner than, than the story. And uh, I've also been talking about the difference between the legend of Dallas, which was that everybody always got along and Dallas didn't have any problems. It's just absolutely untrue. And the fact that there were riots over bus segregation in Dallas in the 1940s. So black people never accepted it. Never accepted it. And, and Rosa Parks wasn't just sitting there with her head, you know, her hands in her lap, staring at her, her knees for years, thinking, oh, this is okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's all right that I have to stand up when there are empty seats in the white section because that's how it is. You know, we get this story that it was, it was quote, a way of life and that people accepted it. Well, the reality is that nobody ever accepted it, not happily. Um, so why? Why was the story told the way it was? And uh, why, why, did, why did the leadership of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference feel that it was important to tell it that way? Well, I mean, you know, historically, strategically, the, the civil rights movement was giving white people a lot to chew on. They were saying, this is over. The segregation stuff is over. And uh, here we come. But they were also doing it and this is an important piece of the puzzle by appealing to the white conscience. The Martin Luther King Jr. sent those children against the police dogs on purpose. Other people in the SCLC said, Martin, don't send children out there. Don't send our kids out there against those dogs. They'll be bitten. And he said, they're going. That was set up. That was meant to happen. 
so that those images would be on television, so that white people would see themselves in this horrific mirror. Oh my God, how could we be doing that? So there was a very important appeal to white conscience. Don't forget that white people were very important to the civil rights movement and to the change. Uh, 1963 and 65 is when the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act were passed, and I always get them mixed up. I don't remember which was which, but I remember that it was LBJ, a white Texan, who pushed that through. And it took a ton of white votes to get those things done, including white Southern votes. I grew up in the North. I've lived my adult life in, in Texas. So I'm aware that this story that we have about how uh, all the racism was in the South and all the segregation was in the South. That, that, that is, that's another thing that's absolutely not true. The town I grew up in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, supposed to be a big liberal bastion, was harshly segregated in the 50s. There was a street through the middle of town called uh, uh, Division Street, and everybody on one side of Division Street was white, and everybody on the other side was black. That's, that's another story. Uh, hey, listen, pledge time. Alan Litt and Annie Litt, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Two generous pledges here. Calling in from Flower Mound with two generous pledges. Uh, <clears throat> Alan Litt, Annie Litt, I can't, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, this really makes a difference. And I hope that others will, will, will follow your lead at 972-647-1893. 972-647-1893. Thank you for your, your generosity. And uh, before I <clears throat> go back to my blah, blah, blah and my bad personality syndrome, uh, let me pause. Uh, we got a caller here, Ann, on line three. Ann, what's up with you today? Hi. Hi. Uh, I, I'm impressed that you know so much about the Rose Park story. What really disappoints me is the fact that you assume that people didn't know this story. I'm African American. I was raised in the Midwest. I went to a private university down here. And in my college, we, it was no. That's what we were taught. Um, Tell me, but, uh, will you, and. It's, it's breaking up a little, but you said something important I didn't quite get. Tell me what you were taught again. We were taught that it was the strategic planning by SL, uh, the Southern Leader Conference, Better Leadership Conference. We were taught that. And it had to be planned. It had to be planned. It had to be planned. And it had to be filmed. It had to be photographed. Right. It had to be that way or it would be have worked. It wouldn't have happened. And then, um, what amazes me, or actually what disturbs me, is the fact that it makes such a big deal about that. Like it's something wrong. My grandparents were from Mississippi. Uh -huh. My grandmother's mother would go into Jackson, Mississippi, and she was so fair skin that she could keep the pass for white, and that was the only way she could get an office job. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Right. So, um, they yeah. were, unfortunately, at a point when my grandfather got older, they had land, they had a house, and, yes, the KKK came, didn't like the fact that they were doing so well, and gave 24 hours to leave the state. And it was a nice thing they did, because normally they would just shoot your hand. Right. So, it was bad in the South. It yes, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. My father was born and raised in Chicago. Mm -hmm. He went to an all a private, one of the top schools in Chicago, and it was an all-boys school, and it was predominantly white. Uh-huh. didn't have any problems. Right. Home with them, they would come over there. My mom, when they moved to Chicago when she was four years old, she went to a very integrated high school. Right. Wasn't 
like that in every northern city where you're saying, oh, there was segregation at their school. Yeah. I'm the socioeconomic segregation. And if we're black, they had some money and lived in the north, you didn't have to worry about someone coming, taking your land, raping your daughter, beating you to death, and not have any justice. I'm going to I'm going to have to disagree with you. I think I think you're right in many many instances, but there were white vigilantes in the north who who rode at night and ran black people off their land in the Ann Arbor, Michigan of the 1950s where I grew up, if a black kid w- stepped across Division Street, the cops were called. And and Ann Arbor was <coughs> Home of the University of Michigan called itself the Athens of the Middle West. You know. picnic <coughs> where people watch someone be burned at their body pieces sold as souvenirs and pictures. Yeah. That was common. <coughs> that did not happen in part. One really sick and tired of saying, oh, it was bad where I lived too. You know what? It wasn't as bad. Take it from people that know and just pay for both sides, in the North and in the South. There was a difference. And and you're absolutely right. And I've I've uh, given a wrong impression. If I'm tr- if it sounds like I'm setting up an absolute equivalence, I mean, there's history. There was a war about this stuff, and the North was on one side, the South was on the other. I didn't mean to erase the importance of that history. <clears throat> I just don't think you can give white Northerners a total pass on racism. I mean, look at the country today. Uh, do you believe that white people in the North are, are devoid of racism? I may have lost you there. Uh, and anyway, anyway, listen, let me, I, I, I want to come back, there's not much time, to this final point that has to do with Dallas, and it came up at this city council retreat. <clears throat> uh, the speaker was Zan Holmes, who many of you would know, the founding pastor of <clears throat> St. Luke Community Methodist Church, a very important African-American leader for many years, now retired. <clears throat> and Dallas City Councilwoman Carolyn Davis, who's African-American, asked him if it was true that the ministers in Dallas back in the uh, 60s were hostile to Martin Luther King Jr. And <clears throat> uh, Holmes said, yes, somewhat true. That, that happened. He didn't get time to finish what he was saying, but he said that had to do, however, with the denominational split within the black church. That's a very important piece of history, too, that we never get to. And it has to do with Martin Luther King Sr. The senior king is always lost in the shadow of his son, but he was an important leader in the black church. The black church was split between people uh, who believed in what was then called assimilation. We would call it integration now. And black people who were more like Rosa Parks, who were Marcus Garvey separatists, who wanted nothing to do with white people. They didn't want to be anywhere near white people. And uh, that was not because they were knuckling under or accepting (coughs) the white regime. It was because they didn't like white people and didn't, didn't respect them. And Dallas was a center of that separatist movement in the black church, in the black Baptist church. Uh, Martin Luther King Sr. led a big battle, and and his wing of the church, which was the assimilationist pro-integration wing of the church, uh, won the battle and sort of took over the church. The black clergy in Dallas remembered all of that. They were very much involved in it. So when Martin Luther King Jr. came here, this was that King family that they already knew and and they disagreed with. Uh, <clears throat> Dallas has remained uh, anomalously a center of separatist feeling. In the 1980s, uh, Bernard Lafayette came here from uh, Tuskegee and did sort of a, a, he's a scholar of the movement, 
and uh, did a kind of consultancy on, on uh, black Dallas and came to the c conclusion that Dallas was unique in the country <clears throat> as remaining a center of separatist sentiment in the black community. That gets muddled when we look back, <clears throat> and it is sometimes characterized as Uncle Tomism. I think <clears throat> as history gets more distant from it and we begin to peel this onion and tell the story more accurately, uh, we will see that that's not fair. Uh, who was more radical? The people who wanted to go live among the white people or the people who didn't want anything to do with white people? That's uh, a question that's above my pay grade, but nobody in that picture comes out as an Uncle Tom. Um, that's a complicated bit of history. It's just interesting that only now are we beginning to be able to unravel some of this and see it more accurately and to see <coughs> Rosa Parks more accurately. As the caller said, she got the right version in school, that the civil rights movement was strategic and it fo was focused and was doing what it did be in order to change history. It presented itself. It, it told the Rosa Parks story differently. It told a story about Rosa Parks that wasn't true, that she was just this humble, quiet lady who had too much. I think it's because they knew that that was the most that white people could take. That if they, <clears throat> they were appealing to white conscience and they weren't quite ready to say, oh, and by the way, we're smarter than you are. We're ahead of you. We're running this show. We're running this history. We may be the minority, but we are, we are wagging the dog. We are changing history from our minority position. So there was a little bit of posing still, uh, a, a, a posturing that involves a little more guileless innocence than was the case. But as history unfolds, what we get back to is a much more believable story that these were smart people who knew what they were doing. <clears throat> Their reaction to the indignities of segregation were always what human reaction would be and should be, which was fury and anger. <coughs> Excuse me. They, they did not have a, ever have some kind of deep-seated respect for the people who were oppressing them. It was quite the contrary. Anyway, it's, it's just... Uh, if, if you get a chance, if you see this book, I'm going to go look for it, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks uh, by Jean Theo Harris, uh, Brooklyn College professor, and it, it, it just sounds to me like a fascinating window on the real Rosa Parks. Um, this is Jim Schutz, been talking to you from Get Off My Lawn. It's Pledge Week, and uh, we need your help, 972 Six four seven one eight nine three. Thank you for my generous pledgers this hour, and I hope there will be some more in the hour to come. Bye bye. See you next Saturday, 10 a.m. Get off my lawn. K N O N 89.3 FM in Dallas and Fort Worth, the voice of the people. Business owners, tell KNON's listeners about your business. You can put your business or event on KNON. KNON currently has space available to run announcements for you. Tell KNON's listeners about your goods, services, nightclub, concert, or event. Help keep the voice of the people on the air while putting your information on the air. KNON's been named the number one radio station in Dallas by both the Dallas Observer and D Magazine. Put your business with Dallas's number one station. Call now for more information at 214-828-9500, extension 227 or extension 233. For more information, go to KNON.org and click on the Run Spots on KNON page. It's a great way for your business to support community radio while letting more people know about you.